As a filmmaker or a photographer, you need a monitor that offers state-of-the-art color accuracy. The ability to use two screens simultaneously and the convenience of connecting multiple machines. Let me introduce you to the 3205 BenQ Designer Monitor, the game-changing monitor that has revolutionized the way photographers and filmmakers work. With an impressive resolution of 3840 by 2160, this monitor provides crystal clear images with vivid colors. The IPS panel technology ensures that the colors remain consistent, no matter the angle you view it from. This monitor has multiple ports, allowing you to connect different OS machines and switch between them using the same screen only by hitting a hotkey. It's a convenient feature that saves desk space and provides you with the ability to edit different projects on different machines with ease. The best part of this monitor is the ability to use two screens simultaneously. You can have two windows open side by side, allowing you to edit your creative work seamlessly. This feature is a game changer as it allows you to see the changes you're making in real time without having to switch between different screens or machines. If you are a filmmaker or a video editor or a photographer who values efficiency and convenience, then the 3205 BenQ Designer Monitor is a must have. It offers a state of the art color accuracy, the ability to switch between two screens simultaneously and the convenience of connecting multiple machines at the same time. Get yours today and revolutionize the way you work. Hey Esteban, how's it going? Hey Ali, how are you? Good, good. Good to see you after NAB. Uh, it's great to have you jump into a webinar right after that event. Yeah, yeah. It was a great meeting. It was a great show. Massive. It's a massive show. Definitely. And you're in shiny New York City, so it's uh, just an awesome view for us too. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful day here. It's been, it's been raining the last week, so it's it's really cool that today we're having a a really beautiful day um yeah and hello to everyone who's joining our webinar i'm really happy yeah, to see you here absolutely welcome everyone thank you for joining another AccuColor webinar series um today we have travel filmmaking creating a documentary series by uh yours truly esteban toro one of the newest thank you ambassadors uh, and a very good friend of mine so esteban uh, we're going to take questions throughout just let me know when you want to pause and we can, uh, I'll read out some questions to you, but uh, here, I'll make you presenter. You can um, take it away and sure. yeah. Sure, sure, sure. All right. So I have the option here to share my screen. I'm just going to first say hello to everyone. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Esteban Toro. I basically am an artist. I work with images, doing filmmaking, photography. I edit myself. Um, I have done a lot of things, documentaries, books. Um, and right now, I'm a BenQ Global Ambassador. I've been with BenQ for the last, for this year, actually. Wow, it's it's May already. It's five months. Um, I have been helping, you know, just to see how the monitors perform, but I actually, have used BenQ way before that uh, to post-process my images. So that's that's those are the monitors that I've been using. So that's my relationship with BenQ. Um, I recently started working with Adobe as well. So I represent Adobe and I'm a Sony ambassador. So that's kind of a little bit of my background. I have been in the, in this industry for maybe 14 years or so. Um, and today I want to I wanted to make something different. I have done plenty of uh, workshops and webinars related to uh, travel photography, but many of you have asked me, like, I also want to understand how to do travel filmmaking. So I was thinking, like, how do I start? How do I start sharing about my experience as a travel filmmaker? And I decided that I just wanted to take you in the journey of how I got there by sharing how I actually how it actually happened. So. First, for those of you that don't know me, I want to run a little bit of uh, images uh, of my own work so you can get familiar with, with what I do. Um, I have been known as a photographer because I started doing photography. That's what really drove me into video. I felt really curious about photographing and documenting all these people that I was meeting in different locations around the world. Um, and some of these images really like stood on people. They were like, some people were like, oh, this, this is amazing how you capture the life, how you 
tell the stories that you tell through your images. I want to learn more. So um, these are some of the pictures that, that have been like, I would say like the most iconic ones uh, that I have photographed in multiple, I mean, in several locations, different years. It's It's been everything that I'm showing you has happened through decades of work and different reasons why I happen to do these trips. And yeah, I just want to share a little bit so you will have a background of like, how do I look at images and why do I care about them? Um, different locations. I think something that really stands out of my work is that I care a lot for, well, as you might see now, like color is one of the main things that I really look for when I'm looking at different images, but also the combination between uh, people and the landscape. How do they live in those places? How they, uh, you know, have a daily life there? And I want to register that. I want to show it. I want to capture it by still images or by using like a film. Uh, so these are some of the photographs that as I said, like have been kind of iconic from my work. And all that led me to a point that was um, people started asking questions. They were like, okay, how do you do these trips? How you actually organize them? How you travel to these places? How you, how you, how you, how you, so many hows, uh, many questions that actually led me to like, okay, this is something that I want to share. And I have been teaching since 2014. So, of course, I wanted to find the right way to do it. I wanted to find the right find the right way to inspire uh, future creators to develop their own work. And in that process, I happened to meet a lot of uh, fellow artists, fellow photographers, filmmakers, you name it. And I met one that really changed my vision, uh, not only because of what I learned with him, but also because what he pushed me to do. So I'm talking about Jean-Paul Bordier. Uh, if you don't know him, I can send you later in the chat. But basically, Jean Paul is um, he's a French artist. Uh, many of you could call him a photographer. He's a University of California professor. I think he's retired now. But he has this amazing, colorful, stunning work uh, that he basically mixes people or bodies painted in like fully painted in the desert. Uh, in different locations around the world. So I met him back in 2014, and then in 2000, like late 2014, he invites me to record a documentary about his work. And I was, I was amazed because even up today, like he is still one of the figures that I really look uh, forward to when I try to get some inspiration. So, um, it was it was really like okay you want me to record you to to film and to share your story that was that was like I don't know how I'm even gonna do that um, I went to filmmaking like to film school and I actually learned like storytelling I learned a lot of like theory of how to create movies and how to yeah I don't know how to do storytelling but I was like I don't know if I'm confident to actually make a documentary but I said yes I said. I just want to learn from you. So I will go with my camera. I'm just going to show up and I'm just going to record and then I will figure it out. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, so I'm going to share with you a trailer of uh, A Photograph Dice. That was the documentary we produced together back in 2015 and we released in 2016. We have to say uh, had just an issue with the sound. So we won't be able to share uh, sound with the movies that I'm going to be presenting because it's going to be a little bit like clunky and we don't want that. So those um, those um, trailers are available online if you want to see them. But I just want to share a little bit of them without the audio. So I'm just going to mute here. You will be right now. It's a black screen. You will see it in a second. And basically, what I, this is the trailer of A Photograph Dice. Um, you will see a little bit of the work and the places he worked in. So these were all locations we spent about a month traveling in those places. And here you see Mike and Monique. They were our main uh, subjects that we were photographing and documenting all the time. So my mission was pretty open because I could say whatever I wanted, but I wanted to transmit one message that is like, how does Jean-Paul see photography and what does it mean for him? 
so we every day I was taking different like shots from camera drones or whatever angle I could and finally when I came back after uh, one month recording uh, I just had all this footage and I had to find a way to actually make that all all the movie will make sense uh, and that's when I really feel that I learned how to edit because uh, I had all this footage I had no idea how to post process it uh, I mean, I technically knew how, but I didn't know how to make it make sense. Um, so that's when I really had a big challenge. And that taught me a lot because that really put me in this position where I needed to learn how to do my craft. And that was that was kind of the beginning of my career, let's say, as a filmmaker. Measure two Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Is this second made a bit longer? And now I want to share with you um, the trailer for Aperture, A World of Stories. This is a series we produce with Sony in collaboration with the New York Times and the World Photography Organization. We started producing it back in 2018 and then we screened the series in 2020 during the pandemic. And we're gonna touch on that. I just want to share with you how the trailer looks like. So here it goes. So this series is actually responding to one question that is how do I create my photographs as I was telling you earlier. So I was like okay I could create some tutorials or some behind the scenes so people could see how I actually take the pictures that I take but I decided that it was better to use a film to actually be able to share how I do my work and that's what I did. So basically I took a crew and we were traveling to five different countries those were India, China, uh, Nepal, Colombia, and let me just go through this, and then the United States. So the first thing I did, I don't know why this is, oh, let's just pause it here. Um, and this is a behind the scenes recording one of the scenes that you just saw. Uh, one of the things that really 
caught my attention while I was doing this documentary. I had the same kind of approach of like, okay, of John Paul Bourdieu's documentary. I had more experience, but I was like, how am I going to actually share a message that I can actually bring people into the world of how is it like to be a travel photographer? And then I thought like, okay, what's, what's the whole strategy around being a travel photographer? First, I plan. I understand what I want to photograph, where I want to go, and then I just go and do it. I capture whatever I can find. And then after that, I bring the images, I post-process them, and I show them to people who actually might be interested in buying them. Editors, art collators, or it can be like, yeah, any person who might be interested in getting my images. Um, so I said, like, I really want to take the viewer into the whole process of doing it. And that's when I had this, uh, I would say, like, inflection point that really changed how I was approaching the documentary. And this is funny. I was I was uh, flying on an airplane. I call it this the airplane idea. And it's I, I realized, like, okay, I'm going to take the viewer to India, China, Nepal, blah, blah, blah. But what I'm actually going to show them uh, after that, like I take all these beautiful images and then what? Like what's what's going to be the difference with any other series that has been made about like any photographer? And then I realized I want to take them into a journey of something that they haven't done. And it's presenting their work and their portfolio in front of these authorities that will or photography leaders or people in the community who will actually come and look at my work and they will criticize it. So the people who is watching the documentary will get the full spectrum of, ah, this is how Esteban thought that this picture will be a good picture. And this is how he actually went and captured it. And these were the challenges he, were fa he was facing. And this is the feedback he got. And of course, I wanted to get like as diverse as possible of, you know, like kind of like visions so actually, I was able to meet with Brent Lewis, uh, who is an editor at the New York Times, and then with Scott Gray, who is uh, the CEO of the World Photography Organization. And I'm going to get how I actually got in contact with them and how, yeah, how it came. But first, what I want you to understand, and this is the airplane idea, is like I want to take it to the next level. I want the reviewers to be someone who is like really like an authority and that will inspire people to watch this series. And why is this relevant? Because sometimes, and this you will face it many times if you're if you really want to do like films uh, in this industry, is like how, like what is something impossible and crazy that you think that will be kind of a, like a dream that you will not be able to achieve, but you will love to have in your movie. So once you identify that, I think that should be your goal. And that's what I actually did for, for my movie. I was like, I want to get a New York Times editor in my movie. So I basically started sending emails, contacting people, knowing who knows someone until I was actually able to find Brent. And I sent multiple emails. He finally agreed to the idea. We planned this with years. So it was like, we're going to be like in New York. Um, that was before I moved to New York City. Um, we, we will be in New York like in October and it was January. So he will be like, yeah, sure, whatever. Like hit me up whenever you will be in the city. Um, but but it was really like, like that's how, how he started. Like I had that dream that I wanted him to be part of my series um, because yeah, I wanted this kind of authority to be to be part of it. Of course, I'm sharing with you just uh, some behind the scenes, some pictures, you know, like kind of selfies that I took while I was on this trip, um, having some fun. These are some images that actually are part of the series and how I like some of the photographs I obtained. Um, but another thing, another situation that I was facing is like, how do I fund the series? How do I make money for the series? And then I just thought like, okay, I need some, I need to actually look into my contacts so i the first thing like i have been a sony ambassador since 2017 so i reached out to sony and i pitched them the idea so i first organized like okay i want to have a documentary that will take people into this journey of how is it like to be a travel photographer and going to all these locations 
I want to have these authorities that will kind of like review my work. And then of course, like I want to involve uh, a brand somehow. So the first, like the first thing I did was reaching the people that I know. So that was Sony and they said like, we love that. We love that idea. We want you to shoot uh, this series using like mirrorless cameras. So I actually travel with multiple cameras, but it was the A7 III, A7S II, and the A7R III. Those were the main three cameras we use uh, for like to record the series. That's that's kind of part of the deal we had with Sony. And of course, they will help us with with a lot of like the funding, uh, planning, and of course, having the support of Sony was was something already uh, great. So that's how we actually ended up doing it. Mm, but the pitching, of course, was was one of the ch biggest challenge because it's like, okay, if Sony rejects it and they are kind of my closest contact, who's going to be the next person? And actually, I had a list of people that I wanted to go through uh, in case that plan plan A will not work. And that's that's how it actually happened. So when we got the yes, and they were like, "Yep, we're on board," uh, it was started. It was just the beginning because then it was the pre-production. So what? Each episode is going to be about what I'm going to be talking about, um, how we're going to structure this episode. So it turned into a massive spreadsheet, and that's that's how I like to to do my projects. It was just a massive spreadsheet that would just show like uh, locations that and the A B roles that we were expecting to get, uh, what we were dreaming that we will get, how we will connect it with something else. So it was weeks and months of of planning and pre-planning the series before we even actually went on an airplane um and of course contacting like local people that will help us to understand what's the current situation in some places and that's how it kind of started now once we travel on location um as i said like it was india nepal china colombia and the united states we had some expectations as to what we were going to see in those places. But let me actually share with you this story. Um, I'm just going to jump really fast in, in all these pictures. I want to go to this photograph specifically. So this picture uh, that it's a woman in, in the Taj Mahal and this is the, the river. Um, I took this photograph back in 2017. I wanted to recreate this image. I wanted to make it one more time because it became kind of one of the most iconic images that I had taken. Um, so I wanted to explain how, like how I did it. And it was funny because I went there and as I was as I was like getting into the location, I was talking to my local producer, my fixer, and I was telling him like, hey, we want to take this photograph. Do you think it will be possible? And he was like, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's that's totally possible. Well, the day we land in Agra and we're about to film it, my producer tells me like, oh, by the way, there is something you have to know. We won't be able to uh, go into the river because recently um, there is this new law that actually doesn't allow people to uh, navigate in the river in these old boats as you did before, so you will not be able to access it. And we were like, oh man. So I told you, we plan several weeks on a spreadsheet, every episode and every scene, and how to recreate this photograph and make it better was a whole episode for the series. So we plan everything based on one photograph and then we were not able to recreate it, which was a challenge because then we had one episode left. We were already on location. We had an idea, but we had to change it. So that forced us to look for another or like an alternative content for this episode. And we decided to switch and go for the Blue Hour and the Blue City in India. So we actually started like, okay, this is something interesting. Something cool happen here. We can talk about the Blue Hour, but that's not going to be enough. So let's think, let's think harder. While we were on location, we had a really tight schedule and already having to kind of like, you know, like provide some answers to, okay, Sony already sponsored it. So what's what's gonna happen? Why we're not gonna have that episode? Um, and how we're actually gonna provide something better. So that's when I like I had been in touch with the Ravari. They're a local community in in this uh, in the northwest of India. 
and I said like, okay, I definitely want to like make an episode about them. So it was more like kind of like in this casual style we were recording without exactly knowing how we were gonna link it after, but we we knew that we needed to get as much B-roll as possible, and that's actually what we did. So we started capturing all these stories, and that's how how it happened. But at the same time, um, some things surprised us for good and for bad. So I was thinking that the worst thing was that was going to happen during our uh, during the shooting was that we were not going to be able to record um, the Taj Mahal story. But well, I met with my friend Harish. She's a transgender ballerina in this area of India that it's like super conservative. And I wanted to make a story about her, but I didn't want to make a whole episode or, you know, I just wanted to touch something on, on her, but I didn't mean that it will become the main episode. And it happened that after we recorded her story, after we recorded some B-roll and some interviews with her and some, you know, like we captured something, a few weeks after that, she passed away in an accident. And of course, that was a shock for the whole crew. We were like, oh, wow. And that's when things changed. And that's when we decided like, this episode has to be all about her, all about her story. And we want to create this tribute to her and to her story. And that's actually what we did. And it became the last uh, episode that closes the, the series. So when I said that it happens for the good and the bad, of course, it's been already some years. The bad, of course, like was her passing away. The good was that gave like this touch to the series that we, of course, didn't plan uh, when we were like just thinking about the spreadsheet, but made like gave this flavor of humanity and the whole purpose of documentary. That is, you can plan as much as you want, but still you have to let life happen in front of you, whatever that means, the good and the bad. Um, and the beauty of film and the beauty of photography is that it helps us to remember, and especially those memories take even, like, make more sense with time. And I think that's that's what it's beautiful about the expected and the unexpected when, when I'm filming. Um, so by now, like, this is a brief presentation of uh, the series. I want to know if there are some questions that I can start solving, and then we will jump into other things uh, that I prepare for you. So I don't know, Lee, if two, we... Yeah, two yeah. questions came in. Uh, first one from David, he says, hello, Esteban, and then uh, how much did the entire production cost of this documentary, or how much did the entire production of this documentary cost? Um, that's a good question. I think it will be around 30k, so it's not really an expensive production. Um, but it was it was hard to to raise the money and to make sure that everyone will um, be on board with the idea. Uh, we had a lot of people who helped us because they wanted to build this series because they believe in it. Um, but yeah, I think about 30k. And then a question from our friend Matt. I think you may have answered it, but. Uh, what was the most interesting interaction you've had with someone you were filming? So I think the story, the, the story of Harish, um, is one is one of the ones that shook me the most because, of course, I, I had been documenting her story for years. I had been visiting her and trying to show. I, I, my idea was completely different. I wanted to show how this um, transgender ballerina was creating and empowering women in her region where everything is super conservative. Um, but then, like, I wanted that to be the story, but not about exactly her or her passing away. But somehow, like, life took me or life just steered in that direction. And I feel that's, that's how it actually happened. So the interaction with her really, really like was maybe the most shocking thing about the series. And I think it became more about her than anything else, um, which I happen to, now that I think backwards, I just happen to love it the most.
Okay, and then uh, one more here from Carol. Uh, <clears throat> do you have to get written permission from the street people in your photos in order for you to publish those photos? So it depends. Uh, it depends what you're doing and what for you're doing it. Uh, if your pictures are gonna go for anything that is like commercial or any profit, profitable, yeah, stuff, yes, you have to. Um, documentaries and depending on the subject, depending if it's more like cultural or depending, like if you're gonna make profit out of the series, uh, then then you will have to get it. Otherwise, um, you don't. In this case, we have the release for the people who actually uh, went into the series, and yeah, we had to do it. We had to make sure that it was all by the rule um so yeah that was that's one of the biggest challenges of, of doing these things so uh well you guys uh send some more questions if you have uh i want to share with you again my screen and i want to share some of the images that i actually skipped so you can get an, an idea let me just share my screen you should be able to see it now um so these are some of the images that I capture while producing this series. Like, for example, this is the Holy Festival. And this was one of the most interesting encounters I had while, while doing it. Um, we had a crew, we had a videographer who was going with us. And I realized, maybe you saw this picture earlier on, uh, just here where I'm sitting. This is the same place, the same location. I'm just sitting with, with uh, some people from the crew and as I'm like, as you're looking, I'm, I'm photographing and documenting and filming from the balcony. Uh, but I realized that the action, the real thing will happen if I will go like underneath. So I was sitting somewhere here, you can see the balconies. But if I will go underneath and I will actually get there with my camera, that's how I will get really interesting shots. So the main shots that you will see, especially here, let me just play it. I'm just gonna mute it. You will see it here. These shots, I was just able to get it just by getting there with my camera, of course, look at all the water being thrown at the cameras and like the water is just getting to my knees and like on, on the bottom. And I just like, I'm just there with my camera, just holding there, there are throwing buckets of water and I'm just filming. I was the only one that I was kind of somehow able to record this footage because I was the only one from the crew who was like, okay, I can actually go down there and, and, and record it um so there are shots there are footage that you can only get if you're the only one doing it so i think that's something that i discovered it also happened with harish to back back to your a little bit to your question ali that was like harish at some point said um i will perform dancing but i will just do it for you so i just want you to be the only one with a camera who will be recording me and of course the videographer will feel like, oh, but you know, like I'm here for that. But sometimes having that access, especially if you build those relationships as I did before, like will take that, you know, like that toll that sometimes I will be the only one with the camera able to access. So I'm just showing you a little bit of the, one of the episodes. This is the fourth episode of the series where I just walk you through what is it like to be in the Holy Festival. When the winter is over and the spring has begun, all India celebrates the Holi Festival, a festival that can be one of the most incredible adventures in a photographer's life. Nevertheless, it also implies getting into the risk of the water. Dancing. Big crowd. being hit hard by women, and the colored powder they throw to everyone.
So finally here we are at the Holy Festival. We're celebrating inside this beautiful temple and we'll be shooting uh, some, of, some, some of the amazing scenes that happens here, like people throwing color powder, water, dancing and praying. And that's gonna be really beautiful. Photographing this festival is not always easy. You have to protect really well your camera and hopefully it's gonna survive after this incredible ceremony. If you find yourself celebrating the Holy Festival, you will enjoy a unique experience of happiness that cannot be found anywhere else. I was shooting this picture, and uh, you know, like it felt so powerful, so colorful, so playful, and then I just turned around, and this guy is looking at me, you know, with this sad looking, and he just, you know, he was, it was like he was just waiting for me mm -hmm. to turn around and take a picture of him. And I don't know, he looked so sad. And, but what I found beautiful is that he's waiting for me somehow. Because if you see here, you see there's another photographer mm -hmm. shooting over here. He has a camera over there. And he just looked at me, gave me this look, and I just took this picture and that was it. The women start tearing off the shirts of the men and they start beating them. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, the men take some water from the ground uh, with color and they throw the water to them. This looks really aggressive. Mm -hmm. Especially when, when you're from, from here, I'm from the balcony. Mm -hmm. That was the first year. I thought, well, okay, it's beautiful. But I have to go down there. I have to go to the ground. I have to look how it, how is it looking from there. So I just, this year I decided, doesn't matter what happened, I'm gonna go there. So I just grabbed my camera. I just covered it really well. And I started walking into the crowd. And actually people were, you know, like kind of uh, advising me not to get in because they noticed my camera. And uh, I just go inside and I just feel how they push you. But you also have water to your, you know, like, uh, like to the middle of your legs and you just walk there and you just feel so pushed and they don't care and they even throw water to my camera. They throw color powder. They didn't they didn't mind about showing anything they called to me. But I knew that I, I was gonna get something really different from at least what I got last year. You can feel it actually. You can feel it in these kind of pictures, how powerful, how they really don't care about throwing water to anyone because you're, of course, you're part of the, of the game. Yeah, yeah. That feels very real, doesn't it? And the confidence then it gives you, obviously, you know, in terms of when you know you've got a successful shot within it and then the confidence to go up to someone and say, hey, you know, let's, let's do it again. It comes across then. In, I mean, that's a very strong portrait. It's a very strong portrait. And I think often, you know, travel photographers or, you know, you know, documentary stuff, can, it can be almost too broad. You know, you, you know, you talked about the, you know, them the whipping the, the men with their shirts and, shirts. you know, but actually focusing on that, you know, and what's the story behind that and what's the narrative behind that? And I think that for me, sort of, those good stories get uh, more under the skin and, and get deeper within it, you know, and where you can really, really understand it more, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to generic. You know, and, and I think that for me, but that's a personal thing, but I appreciate, I mean, I see a lot of photography. So, you know, I, um, whereas maybe people who don't look at as much photography prefer a more general sort of approach. But for me personally, I like, I like the depth of the story. And, and actually that's where, where you've gone into it more. I, 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 I connect with it better because I feel I'm understanding something more unique.
And then other other footage that is it's really interesting is like this type of images, uh, the the Ganges River, and how they are burning bodies near the Ganges. Um, I think it's just powerful because in order, like, I don't want to spoil so much of the series because I want you to go and watch it if you haven't already, if you have, well, you know what, what's happening here. But I had, in order to access to this, uh, to this place, I had to do a lot of things. And that's something that, of course, I couldn't plan on the paper. I couldn't plan on the spreadsheet. And I think that's something beautiful that, that I want to emphasize that documentary is, yes, it's a lot of pre-planning and I love to pre-plan as much as I can, but then it's like, you can't control uh, what's going to happen after. And yeah, I think, I think that's key. So I want to share as well, let me mute this. This is me going to the New York Times, uh, to the office actually, well, you will see it in a second, but it was, it was interesting as I, I said that I was going to, talk about it because I was contacting Brent uh, with the longest time trying to make sure that he will be okay, that I will be recording him and that we could go into the uh, New York Times office and that we could, you know, have all the permits and everything there. Uh, but of course, I was kind of nervous because as I said, uh, now I live in New York City. I wasn't living in New York at the time. So we had to book um, our hotel and our accommodation and in general the trip for couple of days, we had a scheduled one day to make the interview. And that is kind of the main structure of the of these episodes with Brent. Brent is the guy you're, you will be seeing him in a second. Um, but we, of course, had to make sure that uh, there was some buffering in case that he will cancel or he will not be available. And actually, that happened. Um, it was not his intention. He just had uh, other thing that was more urgent than, that, than meeting with us and he had to move it to the next day. So it was kind of good that we had that buffering time just to stay there and be able to have that interview with him. Uh, this is Scott, but you will see Brent in a second. Let me just, I'll just like move, move the playhead just somewhere where, I don't know if I even talked to Brent in this episode, probably not. Uh, well, but you saw him at the very beginning. Uh, here I'm at the Times. So planning like, I, I really like to emphasize that planning is really, really important, but many times like planning for things to happen, things that you expect or things that you didn't expect to happen is really important when you're uh, doing a documentary because it's just life. Like since we're not staging stuff, um, it just happens in front of, of your eyes. And sometimes it's important to just be open that things will actually happen. And well, since I'm, I was showing you Scott Gray, he's here. Um, so as I said, like I wanted to have two different like key figures on on the documentary. I reach out to Sonny and I said, like, you know, guys, I've been thinking that I want someone. Um, do you have any person, any editor, any art collector, any I don't know, any person? And this the person at Sony, uh, Angelo, that I'm really thankful to him, he said, like, you know what? Scott Gray, you know Scott Gray. And I was like, Scott Gray from the World Photography Organization. And he said, like, yeah. Well, he's coming and you know like I, I can I can talk to him and I'm sure that he will be happy to help us with this and I was like holy cow like I'm gonna have I mean if you don't know who Scott Gray is uh, he is basically one of the well he's the CEO of the World Photography Organization that run the Sony World Photography Awards and he's one of the main um, juries uh, during the contest so he knows about photography besides being an art curator and collectionist like mm, he knows a lot about photography and i was like i'm just gonna show my images to him that's that's as scary as it can be uh, so here you see I'm, I'm just discussing with him and something that i found really interesting and this is how the script of the of the film develops as as it goes as we're filming is that um scott's version of or feedback compared to brent's feedback is really different in some photographs and in some others, it's really similar. So that's something that I really liked uh, when I was editing the, the film after in post-production. I really wanted to emphasize on the contrast between two people because many times it has happened that I have had students who come to me and tell me like, you know, I show my pictures to this person and this person said that my pictures will not be a good fit for X project. And they kind of get disencouraged by that 
and then they don't want to show their photographs or their projects to any other person. But by having that background, by being the guinea pig over there and just being like, okay, I'm, I'm the one who actually is showing his photographs to these people and you'll see the contrast, I think that gives a lot of value to the documentary. And that's something that I, I wanted to create for, for this series. Um, and that was strategized as I did it. So it was not like on the paper, on the spreadsheet that I did way before I traveled. That happened after, as I was doing it. Uh, the lucky thing that I had was that I gave myself time. I didn't have like a deadline. Uh, we, of course, Sony and myself, we wanted this out as soon as we can, but we were we were not really rushing it. So I had time to go and review things and change things as we went. And that's, yeah, that's how I, uh, that's how we beat it. What is it that drives us to dream? I wonder where all this road would lead me. Sometimes I like to get lost into different places and I wonder how all this started out. I am Esteban Toro. I'm a travel photographer, but more than a photographer, I'm trying to understand what is all this world about. There is no better place to talk about the biggest passion I have had than here. I am about to share with you some of the most incredible stories I have experienced using my camera as an excuse to capture and share the beauty that this world holds with it. In terms of your access, do you have to, how do you approach that? That's a really interesting question. Uh, I usually, it depends from country to country. Uh, I really do like to stay in one place and get to know the people as much as I can. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you know that when traveling, it's quite hard to do that. So what I did for this trip was that um, I met this guy who used to attend in, the, in a monastery in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And what is really beautiful is that he used to be a monk and he told me a story. I didn't have any idea of that. Uh, people in Myanmar, they all of them have to go to the monastery. On a shot like this, are you then are you then conceiving what you want to do, or are you, I mean that's staged, obviously, in terms yeah, of yeah. The, the, the the monk. So, do you try to emphasize, you know, I want you reading the scripture in the light, or how, how do you approach that in terms of your production? Yeah, what I do here is that I just tell them to, you know, like we look for the location, we go there with the monks. Actually, first we spend a, a few hours there, like like playing with the kids, you know, like getting into. So they were, you know, like feeling comfortable with me because they are not models or something like that, and especially because they are kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we get there, I just tell them like, okay, uh, I want you to, you know, like behave as you normally do. So they just sit there and they just start talking and I'm just standing there with my camera, you know, like okay. just waiting for something to happen. Okay. And that's what I do okay, all the time. Okay. So what you see here is not like, okay, you guys look at each other. No, it's like, okay. you know, it's natural in terms of their, what they're trying what to they do. What they do. Yeah, it's not like... Okay, but you choose the setting like and you choose the... Yeah, like I feel I have to, you know, like uh, look for what I'm, what I'm trying to get. Mm -hmm. And being there and trying to be at the right location at the right moment. But I have to leave, you know, like leave everything to have in there. Yes, yeah, so yeah. that's what I do here. Understood. That's what happens here. Uh, but for example, in this one, what I'm trying to do here, or what happens here, is that, you know, we were just uh, like getting out of the temple, and uh, my friend, that his name is Mo, he just told me like, okay, you know, the, the monks, they only eat once during the day at 11 a.m. So uh, we can join them for the lunch, but I know some of them, since they are kids, they were like, or they are usually late yeah. for the lunch. And since they only eat once, uh, let's just wait for them because I'm pretty sure we're gonna see some of them rushing to get <laughs> into, the, into the restaurant, you know? And that's what actually happened here. Like I was just waiting at this location for the right moment to happen. And actually, you know, I saw some like, some kids like rushing, but they were not running. When suddenly like everything was happening and you know, I thought like, okay, this is the last one. He just came in like running really fast. 
to get his lunch and I get into the middle of the of the you know like in the middle of the <laughs> of the location and uh, and I just start shooting and he just like skipped me like he just moved to the right side but it, it does emphasize actually the importance of having that sort of local knowledge especially in you know travel trophy you know to actually as you say that the, the chap said people are often late so to then conceive that to be in the right place and waiting it just goes to show the importance of needing that local information actually yeah and uh you know you have to do a lot of research before you go and uh when you know when when you get into uh know an, a place really well and yeah. you you also know and you count on locals you can tell how these things usually happen and that's that's how i work that's how i usually work i just like to say if if i only ate once a day i wouldn't be late <laughs> <laughs> i'll be the first person there the right. first one so yeah, you would be that one So, have you heard about the burning bodies in the Ganges? No, no. All right. I want to take a couple more of questions, if there are. If not, I want to show you something. So I don't know, Ali, how we're going with questions. Yeah, uh, one from Oscar. Uh, did you carry a bunch of lenses or limit yourself to just a few? Yeah, I had, um, I'm just searching for something to share with you. Um, I definitely had like a bunch of lenses, a bunch of cameras, but in the end, Think about it. When I'm when I'm filming this scene of the um, the the holy festival and all these people is throwing buckets of water and you know like hitting me with their shirts and stuff like that, I cannot have like a huge equipment with me, uh, which I found that the mirrorless cameras will be great for that. So I had one camera. No, actually I had two. I had one camera in my hand, one lens, and another spare camera in my back um so that that was kind of the gear that i was using so yes i had multiple lenses i had from wide angles to super telephoto like 600 millimeters like the one you saw from the ganges where the bodies are burning and all these boats and yeah all these boats are there that's taken with a wide with a telephoto because we were not able to get as close at first um but in some others i had to use wide angles so this pre-planning occurs not only when when you're sitting down with the spreadsheet before you go on location but as well every day so it's like the good thing about the holy festival is that it happens it takes place for at least five days every day in a different temple but i was able to think like okay if yesterday i shot with this wide angle and i didn't like it what can i do today with a telephoto lens or with a i don't know like 50 millimeter lens that actually will allow me to get closer or to be from the distance. Like I was just trying to think what images, what footage I was able to get while having certain um, uh, focal lengths. So I know that's that's a real long answer, but the answer is like, yes, I had, yeah, like 1635, 2470, 7200, 200, 600. I remember we had a 200, 400, we had a 500 millimeter lens. We had 90 millimeter lenses. We had uh, 35 millimeter lens. 
I think, yeah, I think those were on multiple, you know, like uh, setups of the same lens in order to, yeah, to have multiple backups. Question from Michael. Did you integrate still images into your video clips or any of your still yeah. images composites? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, so in the, in the final uh, series that I really invite you to watch and you can just watch for free now, it's on estevantoro.com slash aperture. Um, you can see that actually th the nature of the series required me to have still images in the, in the film uh, because I'm showing photographs. So yes, the answer is yes. And I tend to use it, even if, even if the project that I'm filming has nothing to do with photography, I will still capture one or two stills because it helps me to impose, you know, like it's, it's an extra resource that I can use uh, when I'm editing. I think that's, that's pretty useful. And uh, one more question from David. Um, can you give us some tips for pitching these kind of ideas in order to raise money? Yeah, oh, that's, I love that question. Thanks for that question, David. Look, there is, yeah, actually, I, I have a list of things that I wanted to, to talk about today. Um, let me put it this way. And I wrote here, like, finding partners who want to help you. Um, sometimes you will think like, okay, and what if I don't have a contact in Sony? What if I don't have a contact, you know, like in the New York Times? I didn't have a contact in the New York Times or the World Photography Organization before I started the series. I happened to meet these people throughout making this series. So if you have an idea and you think that there will be a good fit, just search, research, and search again who's the right person that can help you. Um, develop a good pitch, and a good pitch depends on many things. What are the goals that this uh, company has? So Sony, like they were promoting mirrorless cameras really heavily into the market. Um, so of course they wanted a series where you could show like, okay, you can create and go to all these locations and use this camera. So that was kind of, so the timing is really important. That's, that's what I want to tell you. Um, but also create and build um, relationships. I think that's really important. Uh, sometimes we think like, oh, networking is so hard and networking is just about going and sharing, you know, business cards. I know it can be like, difficult sometimes but i think it's important because these allies will be really relevant when you want to do these projects because you can find support maybe they maybe they will not fund you maybe they will not give you the money but maybe they will uh, connect you with another person who will give you the money or who will uh, know someone who might be um, i don't like to put it in this way but like useful for what you're producing so i think it's really important to build those relationships and networking and yeah just just being in touch with people and asking and this is really important uh look it's not like sony like as i said like i was an ambassador but it was uh, I'm, I'm still I'm an ambassador but like it's not like they came to me and they said like you have to make a series they have never done that like sony has never done that they are like be yourself do what you like and we will support you in what we can. Uh, however, um, whenever I pitch an idea to them, sometimes they have said no, and sometimes they, they see it as a good opportunity. So what I wanted to say is that it's really important that you build those relationships and those connections, uh, even if you many times have a no, uh, like the no you have it guaranteed, but it's important to ask. If I hadn't asked Sony like, hey, do you want to actually go and sponsor this series, probably this will not exist and we will not be talking today. So sometimes it's better just to ask the question and yeah, maybe you will get a no, but that's that's also important. Um, so yeah, I try, I really try to build connections, not only with brands like Sony or BenQ or like, I try to build connection with people. I, I really care about that because I don't know, like I have been meeting a lot of like motion graphic designers lately. Uh, because of my job with Adobe and maybe you know right now I don't need a motion designer but maybe if I'm going to make a 
second season about this i will need one probably i will so why not like it's good to have these relationships so find partners who want to help you and talk to them and share your ideas that's that's my best uh advice but there is not such a thing like this is a step one two three of how you pitch ideas uh keep emails short be really specific when you tell them why you want to do it and why are they the company or the person who can help you to find to reach your goal people is really willing to help um but be super direct on your intentions i want you to help me uh, this is what i need from you this is what you will be getting from me and this is why i believe that it's important to create this project i feel that's how you really grow um, these relationships and how you pitch these stories. Uh, yes, Correct. Juan, you, uh, yeah, you said there was the, uh, the last, oh, okay, go for it. Sorry, yeah, well, one more before you continue. Uh, it's from our friend Matt again. Uh, besides your technical equipment, what is the most important piece of gear you take when traveling for these documentaries? Hmm. What is the most important thing that I take with me? Um, like, I feel I feel that gear, of course, like gear is essential. Uh, being like, yeah, I want to say time. I know how you take time, but you really take time. I want to have time for things to happen in front of the camera because it's a documentary. I'm recording live as it happens in front of, of the lens. So if I don't have time, if I'm busy, if I have, if I have a tight schedule, I won't be able to get the things that I want. Um, no matter how you plan and pre-plan, uh, it takes longer than you expect it will take. Uh, usually, like 90% of the times. Um, so you really need time. That's something that I always take with me. Uh, I always make sure that if I'm planning for three hours shoot, uh, I have a whole day. And if I'm planning for one day, I have three, five days to do it and repeat if needed. Uh, and of course, I, I, I keep that flexibility open so I can, yeah, so I can adjust depending to the situations and conditions that I'm facing as I'm traveling. So that's, yeah, that'll be kind of, of the answer for that one. Um, I want to share with you something that I consider is really, really important and it's a game changer. Uh, let me just, let me, uh, I'm just gonna open here. Um, I'll be sharing my screen in a second. I want to mute it first. So I don't know guys, if you have heard about it, but it's uh, a new feature that we released with Adobe that is called uh, text-based editing. Let me show you first. Let me see if you like, whether you like it or not. Um, and we will discuss about it. Um, text-based editing is you import your media into Premiere Pro and then it automatically transcribes the um, the interviews you can choose the language there are like 17 or 18 languages available and as you see it right there you have all the like the people who are speaking you can filter and edit as you're editing a doc like a word document um which i think is absolutely mind-blowing and if you have been an editor in the past you can't imagine how many hours i spent with the editing team just listening to the interviews that we did to Brent Lewis and to uh, Scott Gray for this documentary and just cutting because they were saying something interesting or just trying to find that moment where they said something. And of course, it's really easy to get uh, burnt out just like looking at this footage. So I'm really amazed. I'm really proud of, of, of this new feature because it, as you can see, no more paper cuts because in the past, if I will give the same uh, webinar or yeah, live stream or workshop as you want to call it, as I'm giving you today, I will say like, after you have the interview, 
try to transcribe it, print it, and edit on paper. So I will really take notes and start like, you know, like crossing stuff and making sure that, you know, like it works as like as this. But nowadays, um, you can just have it um, like directly in the software. I haven't had the chance to like film some long form um, documentary or interview to actually edit it here. But you know, just having this feature makes me want to go and re-edit some things that I have done because I think it's like saves so much time um, that I just wanted to share with you. And besides that, another thing that like that's kind of like a tip on on editing. Uh, it's like yeah, record a lot of B-roll. Of course, like things that happen that can help you build your your story when you're editing, uh, when you're editing your documentary and understand what's the main structure of your series. So as I said, like I let myself, I give myself time to build these structures, to, to, to modify them as I go. But the main thing, the most important thing to me is like, I know what, what's the message that I want to share. I know what I want to tell people. I know what's, what's the feeling that I want to produce when the viewer will watch this, this documentary, this movie. And then I work, that's my base. And that can be an interview. That can be, um, I don't know, that can be a concept, that can be a feeling. And based on that, I just create B-roll that helps me support to make it visually appealing, to make it like stand out. And that's that's how I build like visually my images. And well, sound wise, because I, I don't want to ignore sound even that the sound is ignored uh, <laughs> today. Um, I partner with sound designers who help me, uh, who help my story to be as strong as I want. And many times I have watched my my documentaries, my films without sound, and I'm like, ah, oh, it's not as strong. And that's because I have partnered with really amazing um, sound designers who have made a great job and make, you know, the music, the you know, like the yeah, just the interviews, how they mix it and master it is just so powerful that changed the whole game. So if you really want to take it to a pro level, hire a sound designer, hire a, um, yeah, like a sound person who will help you um, with your story. I think that's that's another tip that I can help you, uh, that I can give you. And before we jump into a Q and A, I want to, let me share my screen again. I'm here on this picture. Of course, I want to share with you, um, this is the like my editing editing setup. This is how I actually post process my my images. So I have two monitors, both of them BenQ. That seems like a BenQ workshop sponsor, uh, and it is. <laughs> but I really that's that's my setup. That's what I use for editing. Um, so what you have here on the right side is my uh, what my designer monitor that I used to have my main footage. That's where I have my timeline. You will see it in a second. And the left one is the photography and filmmaking monitor that I actually used to check uh, the color accuracy. So you, you can see it here. Of course, this is a picture. I'm not always that happy editing. That's just like I'm posing for that picture. But you can see how I'm like, actually I'm uh, color correcting this file here uh, of the video that uh, we presented at the very beginning. And um, yeah, so I have like, if I need some color reference, I use my photography slash uh, videography monitor. And if I want to have my timeline and other like, you know, like panels and stuff, I have it on the designer monitor. So this is kind of my setup to edit my, um, yeah, my, in general, my, my films. And that's that's how I, how I do it. So that being said, um, I want to jump into some questions, if there are any, or we can have a chat. I just want to have some minutes with you to to discuss about uh, how you know how you can make your your films better. So Esteban, uh, two questions from Paris. Uh, let me give you the first one. Did you have to hire extra people before or after arriving on locations, and what was your process in doing so? Yeah, I actually had to hire um, location sound recordist. I had to hire videographers because uh, yeah, I had yeah things happen while you're while you're on on set and while you're shooting. 
Um, so yes, I did, and I basically did it through word of mouth. So recommendations. Hey, who knows a person in New York City who can help me to record this interview in the New York Times? And that's how I found uh, the sound person. And like the sound person who helped me in New York. Um, I had to hire local fixers. I had to change people. So it, it's you got to be open to it all the time. Um, but basically, it's word of mouth. And that's when building those relationships is important, really important. There are more chances that you will be hired through someone's recommending you than sending resumes or sending portfolios, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because it's a direct link. So building those relationships, I can't stress on that enough. Here's a good follow-up question from Oscar. Can you talk a little about the logistics involved, equipment, transportation, permits, customs? That, that's, that was hell. Especially, I mean, moving through different countries, um, we had multiple luggage of camera equipment. Uh, some of them we were able to take with us as a carry-on. Some of it we had to check in, which was always like finger crossing that it was not just going to get lost, uh, which is pretty usual. Uh, of course, we had insurance uh, for all this equipment, so that was that was important. Uh, in some places, we had to hire security uh, because we were recording with expensive equipment and we didn't want to like, you know, like expose ourselves in, in some locations. Um, but basically, it's, it's just logistics. That goes to production. Um, I maybe feel myself as a producer as well. So I I help managing those things. But we have people. We had people who help us with with those logistics as well. But yeah, that was. I mean, that sounds like we were a really big crew, but we were not. Uh, we were like it's a lot of people building it, but it was like on different pieces depending on the area where we were filming. But it was generally speaking like three, five people uh, on each location. So um, you have to manage those things. And it's 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 just a hell. I remember, especially that doesn't happen here in the States, but on Asia, in Asia, it, it's it's pretty frequent that um, they will wait your your carry on. And actually, yeah, I had like I remember like my carry on was maybe I don't know. I remember it was in kilograms, like 29, 30 kilograms. And of course, the maximum allowed is like 10. And yeah, and the guy was just like, this is like 30 kilograms. And I was like, I know, but I have just equipment. And he was like, okay, just just go with it. Some other times they were, uh, they were not as nice. And actually I had a, a laptop that got broken because they checked in my luggage and the laptop was just there. And well, yeah, that's that's a story. So it's it's never easy. Um, but yeah, as, oh well. But something, some tip I can give you is like if you can have some um, Pelican um, luggage to protect your cameras, and you can just use the the foam that comes with it. That's gonna protect your equipment the best way possible. So Pelican, I use Pelican Air. I really love like they are not sponsoring this, but uh, I really love them, so that's that's a good way to protect your your gear while traveling. Some questions about uh, color management. Uh, yep. Part two of Paris's question: uh, Did you use a video color correction card often in your footage? Uh, <laughs> that that will be a good solution, but that was like impossible to do, especially when we were filming, kind of you know, like in this guerrilla style that is like something just happening in front of you. Like you barely have time to turn the camera and start recording. Um, that's, I feel that's really useful for studio or places where you have like a lot of control on on the light and the color and that helps a lot. But I, I basically like, yeah, did color management after, which is a huge challenge. Um, matching different camera sources, matching different lights, um, but we kind of created a aesthetic around it and how we wanted the, the film to look like, and that's how we operate after in post-production. Uh, question from Joyce. 
uh, your images, especially the ones at the beginning, have very beautiful colors. How much adjusting do you do on the post? Uh, do you use any specific software for your color work? So I color graded um, all the images that you're seeing. I color graded them in uh, Premiere Pro, so Lumetri. That's that's what I used to to color my images, and the photographs were just uh, post processing Adobe Lightroom. And honestly, not that much. I make sure I don't I don't change my images that much after I capture them. Like I actually keep them pretty close to how I saw them. I just make sure that the light when I'm recording and um, yeah especially the light uh, is the light that I want to record and then it's super even super easy to match it's just a couple of tweaks here and there and, and you got it ready so yeah it's, it's not that hard question from Michael um, what would you say is the average length of different video clips you seem together to make your videos I think it's a good combination of 2470, so about like 35 millimeter, like on the 2470, and probably a couple of 70 millimeter ones, and then 16. So 16, 35, and 70. That will be kind of the average, if there is such a thing. And then a, a comment from Paris. Uh, my biggest experience is sound design. So thank you for giving such a warm shout out to the work we do in sound design and master. It's so important. And I apologize. We were we were laughing with Ali earlier today, uh, like on the green screen, that uh, it's so funny how sound is always ignored. And today just happened. Like it just, but it's just, yeah, the software we're using um, today to, to, to do this broadcast. But like in general, like sound is so ignored and it's so important. I can tell you, you can have really bad recorded footage. If you have a really good soundtrack, that's a, an excellent movie, uh, not the other way around. So it's funny that it's called audiovisual because it's more visual, sorry, it's more audio than visual uh, in that sense. Uh, of course, visuals are important that, that make us fall in love with, you know, like the whole aesthetic. I'm a filmmaker, so I don't mean to say that it's not important, but uh, I really feel that sound doesn't get the place that it should. So I really partner with, with sound engineers and sound designers and I like, okay, how can I make your, you know, like your life easier? How, what can I do better? And then it always works out. So yeah, yeah my pleasure. Carol uh, wants to know, how did you protect your camera from the dust and the amazing photos from Africa? Uh, from Africa, I think maybe you mean from the ones of the Holy Festival in India, or maybe, well, in general, like generally speaking, for the Holy Festival that was super like dusty and a lot of color and water. I don't want to spoil it. I want you to go and watch it. It's the third episode, third, fourth, the third episode of Aperture. I actually tell you how I protect my camera and I actually show you how I did it um, because that was a question, like how how will you protect your camera from, from those rough conditions? Um, but basically, yeah, it's just a couple of things, nothing super complicated to be, to be fair. All right, Esteban, that's all the questions we have. Great, well, that's awesome. Well, thank you, it, it, time just flew by. It's, it's just interesting. So. I, you know, like this is kind of a beginning of how I see how I envision travel filmmaking. Um, I hope that some of the tips you watch today will help you. Of course, this is how I do my workflow, but every filmmaker will have its own way to, to do it. Um, but feel free to reach out if you have any questions after. I don't, I don't think I said it like now, but well, if you want to talk to me after Instagram, email, uh, you can contact me, I'm Esteban Toro, so if you search any social media, you will find me. And I'm happy to answer questions, to, you know, like to, to connect, to stay in touch. Um, I'm meeting with a lot of filmmakers all over the country because of my, my job with Adobe. Um, I'm, I'm here for you, so, and also I'm here for you if you need, like, any recommendation on your monitors, on how to, you know, like, how to choose the right monitor for you, happy to help. Uh, well, Esteban, uh, on behalf of BenQ and, um, you know, the AccuColor brand and the AccuColor webinar series, uh, we're 
you know, it's been a joy and a treasure to have you on today and uh, always looking forward to your next uh, big works. Sure, sure thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone who joined, and I will see you in the next one.